Good afternoon and welcome to the National Capital Planning Commission's October 3rd, 2019 public meeting. For all in attendance, today's meeting is live streamed and will be available as a video. Noting the presence of a quorum, I would like to call this meeting to order. And I'd especially like to welcome uh, Paul McMahon as the DOD representative today for uh, this commission meeting. Welcome, Paul. Uh, before we proceed with the agenda, there is one procedural matter we must undertake. We're getting good at this, I think. <laughs> um, in the absence of the chair, the bylaws require the commission to elect one of its members to perform the function of the chairman at the start of each meeting, with the understanding that the vice chairman is the likely person to be elected to run the meeting. So the commission must nominate and vote on who should run the October open session. Is there a motion? Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor of uh, electing Mr. Gallus as the commission's vice chairman to run today's meeting, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Well, thank you very much, my fellow commissioners, for electing me to run this meeting. <laughs> Pleasure. Okay. Um, Agenda item two is the report of the vice chairman. Um, so a couple of things. I think on uh, September 21st, it was my honor to represent the commission at the ceremonial groundbreaking of the National Native American Veterans Memorial. It was a spiritually moving ceremony to celebrate the future memorial of Native American veterans. And we look forward to the final review and approval of the memorial design very soon. Second, uh, NCPC, in partnership with the American Society of Landscape Architects, hosted an important public symposium on security and the public realm on September 24th. And that was followed uh, with the next day with a half-day workshop uh, as uh, dealing with that as well. I was pleased to kick off both these events and thought this was an exceptionally important dialogue between security, design, and planning professionals, as well as many local stakeholders that manage and program the capital city's public spaces and events. Throughout the discussions, the focus was on how to balance the need for inviting spaces that also provide an acceptable level of security for users in those spaces. I, when I uh, Offer special thanks to the staff for creating an engaging and well-organized event on such an important topic. And I also want to thank Commissioners May and Wright for participating in this important dialogue. Um, another note, at last month's meeting, the Commission deferred action on a proposal for the Naval Support Facility at Suitland. NCPC and, and the applicant staff continue to work on this proposal and it will likely be considered at the November meeting. And finally, I'm happy to say that today, October 3rd, is my mother's 93rd birthday. And so uh, so spend, I'll send good thoughts to, to mom. Thank you very much. OK, moving on to agenda item three. It's the report of the executive director, Mr. Acosta. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and happy birthday to your mother. Thank so, you. Thank uh, you. NCPC will host an open house on Monday, October 7th from 6 o'clock to 7.30 p.m. to give the public an opportunity to learn more about the proposed updates to the transportation element <laughs> of the comprehensive plan. Uh, these also include policies addressing parking at federal facilities, visitor destinations, and a more detailed discussion of emerging trends and new technologies. Uh, attendees can learn more about the update, ask questions, and provide written comments at the open house. And we are accepting comments through November 12th of this year. I'd also like to echo your comments regarding the uh, September 24th Security and Access to Public Space event. I'd like to thank the staff, uh, led by Serena Singh, uh, who did an outstanding job preparing for the public event and agency symposium. So thank you very much. Okay. So uh, that concludes my presentation. You have a written report before you, too. Ms. Singh, the only thing you didn't have on the agenda was the fire alarm that we had to deal with. but. But we handled it with a plum. I was really impressed with, this, with the way it all handled. We really didn't miss a beat. So it was a really tremendous day. Thank you. Uh, agenda item four is a legislative update from Ms. Schuyler. 
Well, first and most importantly, a very happy birthday to your mom, you. and I wish her many more. Thank you so um, much. On the legislative front, I have nothing to report. Okay, thank you. Okay, then moving along to agenda item five uh, is the uh, consent calendar. There are three consent calendar items on this month's agenda. The first item is for exterior improvements to the National Gallery of Art East Building, submitted by the National Gallery of Art. The second item is for the Joint Base Andrews Firing Range Facility Expansion, submitted by the Department of the Navy. And the last item is for a change in cladding at the St. Elizabeth's West Campus Interstate 295 facing wall, submitted by the General Services Administration. Um, I don't know if, uh, uh, Mr. May, if you have anything you'd like to comment on this before we move for a mo motion. Of course. <coughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, so first of all, let me just say I'm not going to vote against in the consent calendar or any particular item on this. Um, I do want to say about the uh, project involving the change in cladding um, at St. Elizabeth's on the, uh, uh, the 295 facing wall, which is the most public face of, uh, of that wall. Um, Unfortunately, the, the, the die is already cast on this. I mean, we already approved using um, uh, form liner instead of real stone on other portions of the, uh, of the retaining wall through Shepherd Parkway, which is much more important uh, to me in my role uh, representing the Department of the Interior and the National Park Service uh, because that was within Shepherd Parkway. Um, I don't think that's a change we ever should have made. Um, and I think in this circumstance, I'm not particularly in favor of doing it here either, but uh, I understand that there's a consistency issue at this point. Um, I would also say uh, that I appreciate the staff's uh, attention to the details on this and their noting that, the, uh, uh, that we've been working with the GSA and, and DDOT in particular on uh, the staining and the finish of that form liner to make it as stone-like as possible. Um, close proximity to there, we have probably the worst example of form, form liner you can see with the 11th Street Bridge project, another change that never should have been made and was made without our knowledge and without the SHPO's knowledge and it was a real problem. Um, but this is better, what we're seeing in the, in the dyeing and the, the, the staining and the, and the finishing is better and hopefully we'll get to something that we can all agree on, and it will not be um, as bad. I still wish it were stone, but as bad. All right. Well, thank you for your comments. Um, you any... know, I can't let that sit there. Okay. I, that's why I was <coughs> Commissioner Ma Right. So glad you decided to bring this up um, because I feel very strongly about it that a $12 million delta in expense was not a judicious um, choice uh, uh, for uh, the access wall, I mean, the, the access road wall that will be visible by people, generally speaking, going 60 miles an hour. We have, um, I'm also um, dismayed to hear you say that the qual that form stone can't ever do the trick. I think you know this. I'm a proud Baltimorean, and we happen to think form stone rocks. Um, so I we stand by our decision. We understand that the Park Service is not happy. Hopefully, in the future, we will be able to agree um, on material solution. And I'll that, and that, I will leave it at that. If I may, of course, I had a feeling. So first of all, let me say we are not totally 100% opposed to formstone. I think I've mentioned before that we have used formstone selectively in certain areas. To great effect on the BW Parkway. It's fine on the For BW example. Parkway. It's a very low wall. It's not 20 feet tall. Uh, and so yeah, there are moments when that's OK. I will also say that I live in a house with formstone on it. You do. I do. <laughs> Although I am going to take it off. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't a particularly good joke. Um, I, I will say, I mean, I understand completely the, the, the budgetary limitations, um, and I understand why GSA made the decision. Uh, I still don't think that it's something that we should have supported. Um, there are many uh, very fine-looking uh, stone uh, walls 
flanking uh, highways through the district, fl flanking uh, bridges, supporting bridges, um, and it, it looks a whole lot better than what we see at the 11th Street Bridge, which I say is the worst example um, in close proximity. And I'm sure you've seen that. You understand what I'm talking about. That I haven't it. seen it, or I haven't looked closely at it, but I will now to yeah. ensure that we don't do the same thing. Yes, I think that's well worthwhile. Okay. And I would also say that the people going by it, I hope, are not going 60 miles an hour because the speed limit is 55. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, yes, Commissioner Dixon. I hesitate to speak to a consent item like this, but it looks like it's getting a lot of attention. Uh huh. But it got a lot of attention when it first came to us, and I shared some thoughts and feelings then. Uh, I, the folks I know won't be going by at 50 miles an hour. They'll be looking at it as they it's their neighborhood, <laughs> and that's why I spoke to it a long time ago about trying to do the best you could do, because there's some folks who live with it; they don't drive by it. Uh, it's odd that. Both of these discussions are about facilities or things that are in, uh, I call it R, Anacostia River East. You've got a bridge, 11th Street Bridge, with something that doesn't seem to meet the taste that we might like. And now we've got another wall coming up that might not. Uh, but, you know, it's the functionality, I guess, that we've we, we got to be happy about that we got the bridge and that we got a wall. But it would be nice if we got some of the same attention. I can assure you that if it wasn't in R, Anacostia River East, if it was in Rock Creek Park, it may be a different discussion, or in Upper Northwest, it may be a different discussion. And I just want to make the point. Thank you. OK, I think, uh, thank you for the comments. Uh, and I do think that everyone's really pointing toward making the best of uh, what could be, and we hope will be, a uh, a, a good resolution to this. Um, so thank you for your comments. I'd like to ask now if there's a motion. I want to, I actually want to, make, I want to make two more comments that are sort of have the same emotional tinge. I too, I mentioned, but I too attended the September 21st uh, ground, groundbreaking for the Native American, and I think I may be one of, one of the few Native Americans on this commission. I am. I'm a card carrying Native American. I got documents. Uh, I'm a card carrying other things too. <laughs> I got documents. Uh, and also, I'm sorry that I missed the public space discussion because uh, east of the river, in our Anacostia River East, we are almost ground zero now with Homeland Security, with, uh, with uh, Boulding on now base, joint base on Anacostia Boulding. All those facilities are in our community. And it would be nice to have known how the public space was going to be handled uh, around us. Uh, but uh, anyhow, next time I'll be a little clearer on when it's happening and that be there. But we'll keep an eye on it. Thank you. Well, the, the dialogue will continue uh, coming out of that symposium of some, uh, some amazing uh, national experts on uh, security and uh, public space. And so uh, that kind of rich dialogue is something that I think NCPC played a very important role in sort of hosting and bringing these parties together in a very significant way. So, Mr. John, I would also say that I spent a lot of time in Ground Zero, having served in the military. I was, my, my last 10 years as, a, as a, a full colonel was at the Pentagon. So I know about Ground Zero, but I will tell you that a hit in Southeast <coughs> could do a lot of damage given what we got over there. Oh, let's pray that that doesn't happen. Um, okay, let's come back to the consent calendar. Uh, I'm going to ask for a motion to approve the consent calendar. So moved. And is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor of uh, that motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimously carried. Thank you. Um, by the way, Commissioner Dixon, I, I didn't see you there at the... Uh, Grandpa, it was really a wonderful sound. I, I was dressed. Oh, yeah, that was yeah. my attire. Okay, brother. Um, okay. Um, let's move to the open session. We have uh, today, we have two national memorial projects to uh, review and discuss today. So uh, moving to the first one uh, is agenda item 6A, approval of final site development plans for the National World War I Memorial. And uh, 
I just want to say that uh, this is a particularly important topic to me. My grandfather is a vet was a veteran of World War I and a wounded uh, veteran. And so uh, very excited to be a part of this today. Thank you. Good. Thank Mr. You, Mr. Fliss. Vice Chairman. Members of the Commission, the National Park Service, in collaboration with the World War I Centennial Commission, has submitted the final site and memorial plans for the National World War I Memorial. Uh, you'll recall last February you approved the preliminary plans uh, with comments to be addressed with this final review. The applicant has continued to develop the project in response to those comments and also others in coordination with the Park Service and the Commission of Fine Arts. Congress has designated Pershing Park as the National World War I Memorial. A uh, two-stage competition was held to select the memorial designer and the winning design called the Weight of Sacrifice was selected by the World War I Centennial Commission. Under the Commemorative Works Act, NCPC has an approval responsibility for the memorial. So at the commission retreat you held last month, um, you learned about the different stages of review for various projects, including commemorative works. In this case, the site uh, was already selected by Congress, so the commission is just looking at the design of the memorial and the park. Particularly relevant to this final review are uh, a couple questions um, and uh, areas of interest, including whether landscape plans and details have been provided, whether a lighting plan was provided, what are the signage and security design details, um, are the materials and plantings durable and appropriate to this climate, and then generally has the applicant addressed the com comments by the commission from the previous review. So as a reminder, Pershing Park is located in downtown Washington, D.C. It's uh, highlighted here in yellow, bounded by Pennsylvania Avenue to the north and south and 15th and 14th Streets to the west and the east. The park is located in uh, an important ci civic and symbolic corridor. This, you know, obviously links the White House and Congress, um, highlighted here, and uh, the site is highlighted here in orange. The park is also within the Pennsylvania Avenue National Historic Site, which has many important cultural and civic um, facilities. In 1979, the Pennsylvania Avenue Development Corp Corporation commissioned landscape architect Paul Friedberg to design Pershing Park, um, and here you can see the current site plan. Under Friedberg, the park became a shaded refuge with a waterfall and a sunken water feature, and a memorial to General Pershing was also integrated into the park plan. And, here are some images of the site um, from more recently, and I think at this point you're all familiar with the location. The park was determined individually eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. So today is the culmination of a series of reviews by this commission. Um, today I will again focus on how the applicant has responded to the comments that you provided at preliminary approval. I'll also discuss the conclusion of the environmental review um, and Section 106, or, or Historic Preservation Review process. The park and memorial design has changed substantially since the competition winner was selected in 2016. And since that time, the proposal is focused on restoring and rehabilitating much of the original park design while incorporating those changes that are necessary to accommodate the memorial program and also enhance the fun functionality and accessibility of the site. Uh, I want to first start by saying the applicant uh, really does seek to improve the park and staff believes this will be beneficial as a whole to the Pennsylvania Avenue corridor as well as the surrounding uh, community. Overall, we find the memorial and the enhanced park is a positive addition to the Pennsylvania Avenue corridor. And further, the World War I Centennial Commission can be an important uh, partner to help in enhance the corridor um, and, and the avenue through programming, uh, events, and other activities that will engage visitors, residents, as well as the general public. And we think this is particularly important as NCPC continues uh, its work with our other partners through the Pennsylvania Avenue Initiative. So the uh, project overview um, includes, again, the rehabilitation of much of the park fabric and the retention of the existing Pershing Memorial. A new memorial element, the sculptural wall, will be inserted into the west end of the restored pool, and a new viewing platform will be added. The landscaping uh, and lighting will be enhanced and accessibility will also be improved. Again, overall, the design seeks to balance the commemorative program with a desire to create an inviting park. So I'm going to focus on those uh, components today related to your previous comments, um, as well as some other changes that the applicant has made uh, since your last review. These include um, some further details regarding the memorial wall as well as the lighting strategy, uh, some additional information about the pool and the walkway. 
um, updates on the signage and landscape, and then finally some of the other additional interpretive elements and details that have been developed. So as I mentioned, the two major commemorative elements are the new uh, memorial wall, which you can see on the kind of uh, the left-hand side of the screen, and then the existing Pershing Memorial, which is on the right. The existing Pershing Memorial, again, is going to stay in place, um, but it is being enhanced with new lighting and improved legibility for the walls. Uh, the wall text will be easier to read, um, and as you may know, some of the improvements have already occurred on site and um, are already much improving that um, experience. Here's the memorial wall, uh, which will be a new addition. Again, this is a standalone element in the west end of the pool. This provides a narrative related to a soldier's journey through the war. The freestanding wall integrates a water feature at the base here. Um, this is consistent with some of your earlier requests. And this also creates sound and movement uh, consistent with the original uh, Pershing, uh, uh, the original Friedberg fountain. The applicant has continued to study the detailing of the sculptural elements, um, including how the scale and the height of the figures uh, will be perceived by the viewers, and you can see here some of that analysis. The materials and detailing have also been further resolved uh, with a combination of uh, granite finishes and other materials um, to provide different textures. All of these materials are quite durable, um, and this is consistent with the standards set forth in the Commemorative Works Act. Looking at the western face of the wall, again, this was also will also have a water feature, uh, a fountain, and textured granite finish. This side will have a quote related to the search of peace, which is an important counterpoint to that war narrative occurring on the east side of the wall. The space here will have um, seating on the steps and a more intimate feeling than that large central plaza, so this will provide a different experience for um, uh, memorial and park visitors. Previously, the commission had requested a um, lighting uh, plan and scheme for the site, particularly focused on the memorial elements. Um, in response, the applicant has prepared a full lighting plan and details with renderings that explain the lighting approach. Here you can see um, the idea to distinguish several different zones within the site for different lighting approaches. For example, the perimeter lighting is essentially uh, building upon the existing uh, pedestrian um, and uh, pedestrian lighting. Um, the existing conditions. And then as you move into the, into the site, there are focal areas, um, obviously for the memorial, but then also arrival and gathering spaces. So I'll just walk you through a, f a few quick renderings here. You can see um, the general lighting levels uh, for circulation are intended to be low, but um, meet safety requirements. Um, and here you can see the southeastern approach to the Pershing Memorial focused on that pedestrian level lighting. <laughs> Here you can see the memorial wall. Um, this will be illuminated through uh, two pole lights. Um, again, this lighting will allow you to experience the memorial in a different way um, than would be, uh, would be experienced during the day. And here you can see the other side of the uh, memorial wall um, at night. Overall, uh, staff finds the lighting approach appropriate to the memorial on the site. Um, and it's also in a manner that's compatible with the memorial surroundings and setting within Pennsylvania Avenue. The proposed design, again, restores the central plaza and the pool and adds a pedestrian path that would allow visitors to circulate in front of the commemorative wall. Um, this, this approach includes a central platform in the middle of the pool, which you can see here, with a scrim of water that's shallow in depth um, but helps expand the water um, in, this, in this area. Around the platform, there would be a deeper um, area of water. This is consistent with the original pool uh, design. Uh, the commission had previous, previously expressed uh, support for this design as it helps reinforce the edge of the original pool. Um, and also, it appears as a deliberate and contemporary appro uh, insertion into the historic park uh, fabric. However, given the amount of hardscape, the commission had also recommended the applicant consider different kinds of materials and paving colors to help differentiate the pedestrian kind of circulation areas uh, from the scrim. In response, the design has been updated to include two different materials for the pool and walkway. Um, these are varying colors and shades of the granite finish, uh, which we believe is consistent with the commission's request. We think that these uh, two materials help break up um, the uh, paving areas and will help, again, distinguish the walkway areas from the pool and the scrim. 
In your past reviews, the Commission also commented about the need to improve the corner access, um, and you had expressed support for simple horizontal uh, signage at the corners. Uh, the applicant has um, provided some additional details regarding those, and you can see here these um, kind of low um, signs that will be provided at the entries. The uh, applicant has also further developed the uh, planting plans um, to help improve uh, the experience throughout the site, including at the corners. Um, you can see here providing some additional colorful uh, plantings that will highlight these entries. Overall, the landscape approach builds upon the historical um, scheme developed by Elm Van Sweden. I'll mention that the, some security measures have also been integrated into the site plan. Um, there are, these are simple bollards at key locations as well as reinforced planters along Pennsylvania Avenue in general. We find these are uh, generally unobtrusive and simple um, while meeting the security needs. Moving on to the landscape, I, I do want to mention um, some of the changes that are proposed. Here you can see the existing trees and um, what's evident are the gaps in the existing canopy. These are going to be filled in uh, through the new uh, landscape, plan, uh, landscape scheme you can see here. Um, so again, this provides an opportunity to, provide, uh, to create more tree canopy and shade um, in a way that's consistent with the original intent of the landscape. Um, the applicant will also be providing larger planting areas and um, new soil, so this will help promote, uh, you know, the long-term survivability of these uh, trees. Just some other um, details. You can see the uh, proposed tree canopy palette. Again, this builds upon the original landscape plans. And then also, again, the understory plantings will be uh, replaced and improved, adding uh, color and texture throughout the site. At the plaza level, the terraces along Pennsylvania Avenue, um, the planters will also be um, improved. Again, these are plants that are durable to the climate, uh, to our climate, and appropriate to the site. Moving on, the commission had indicated that the commemorative element should not overwhelm the site, um, so that it could still function as a park within the city. I'll talk about some of the other features very briefly. The first, focusing on the Belvedere, which is highlighted here in red. This, uh, as you may recall, was the former location of the gazebo or kiosk. This area of the Belvedere is proposed to be used for orientation and interpretation. Um, there will also be some um, a, an additional accessibility features like a tactile model nearby. This helps to promote interpretation for users of all abilities. In general, we do support the location uh, for, for this um, activity. Uh, because it's centralized and it also affords views both to the new memorial wall as well as the Pershing Memorial. And it's centrally located so that anybody entering the site can kind of find their location here. A flagstaff and uh, new inscriptions are also proposed at the western side of the, of the site. And then other limited inscriptions are proposed for the planners along Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, overall, we did not feel that these uh, new features uh, overwhelmed the site and were appropriate to um, balancing that kind of park experience with the commemorative approach. I'll note that the applicant is also proposing to integrate uh, digital information into the park. Um, this is something new that we haven't really seen before. Um, this is through the use of information poppies uh, with QR codes, and you may be familiar with these. These are kind of like the barcodes that you, you can scan with your phone. Um, here you can see a site plan uh, showing the locations of these poppies, which will be physical elements that you can actually um, scan for additional information. The intent is that you'd be able to use your smartphone to access online information about the, the moor and uh, the memorial and the site itself. Um, staff has greatly appreciated the thoughtfulness and attention paid by um, the applicant in developing the interpretive elements. Um, ranging from the wall and some of the, the sculptures that I know the Commission discussed at the last meeting, um, reflecting upon the diversity of experiences and people that participated and, and took part in this uh, historic event. As such, we do recommend commending the World War I uh, Commission for their thoughtfulness and depth, depth of the interpretive program um, and also the integration of both traditional and uh, new means within the uh, memorial and park. So to conclude, I'd like to just briefly discuss the historic preservation and environmental reviews uh, pursuant to Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. 
a MOA, um, Memorandum of Agreement, was developed um, to resolve adverse effects on this historic site. The MOA does identify mitigation me measures, including the preparation of a National Historic Register nomination, as well as the development of a modernist landscapes uh, context study. Uh, you'll recall from the Modernist Landscapes Forum um, and also some of the discussions with the, the parks and open space element, this is a topic of interest to NCPC, so we are um, excited to see this study initiated. <coughs> and then finally, regarding the NEPA process, an environmental assessment was prepared by the Park Service with NCPC as a cooperating agency. The primary impacts were those related to historic resources, which I just mentioned, and they were resolved through the MOA. As such, staff recommends the Commission find that in, in accordance with the National Environmental Policy Act, your action to approve the memorial will not have a significant impact on the human environment. So overall, staff finds the applicant has been responsive to the, to the Commission's comments and the design has improved as a result. And therefore, it's the Executive Director's recommendation that the Commission approve the final site development plans for the memorial finds the design has been updated to reflect the Commission's comments, finds the design meets the criteria set forth in the Commemorative Works Act, com uh, commends the World War I Centennial Commission for their interpretive program, <coughs> finds that the approval of the design will not have a significant impact on the human environment, notes that a uh, MOA has been prepared to conclude the Section 106 process, and finds that the Memorial Park will be a positive addition to the Pennsylvania Avenue corridor and further, the World War I Centennial Commission can be an important, important, important partner as we uh, continue to work to enhance the avenue. That concludes my presentation. I'm available to answer any questions. Um, Mr. Edwin Fountain with the World War I Centennial Commission is also here today, uh, I believe, to provide some brief remarks. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Fountain. Thank you. Good afternoon, and, and thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you briefly. And, I apologize for my voice. I was at a, a meeting Tuesday night with 42,000 colleagues at, uh, on South Capitol Street Go and uh, Go had to raise my voice a few times in order to make myself heard. Um, I'm, I'm here today to tell you that the World War I Centennial Commission, as the sponsor of this project, is pleased to present the, the memorial design that you've seen today and, and, um, and, and to ask for your approval of the staff recommendation. And in anticipating that removal, I ask you to indulge me in a few brief reflections on, on the conclusion of what, I, on what I hope is the conclusion of a three-year design review and compliance process. When we undertook to create a National World War I Memorial at Pershing Park, removed from the trio of war memorials on the Mall, we knew that we first faced a challenge similar to that faced by most war memorial sponsors, which in this case was to design a memorial that properly conveys the nation-changing and world-changing significance of World War I, that properly conveys the magnitude of American sacrifice in that war, and that commemorates the accomplishments of American forces <laughs> with a physical scale and an emotional weight that is commensurate with the memorials on the Mall to the three other wars of the 20th century. We also knew that we were taking on an additional challenge that many other war memorials do not face which is to construct a memorial that is integrated within a well-functioning urban park, such that the memorial and park design elements are balanced and harmonious, the park does not marginalize the memorial, and the memorial itself does not limit the potential civic uses of the park. And then as the project moved forward, we were tasked with a third challenge, which was to preserve and restore to the greatest feasible extent the contributing features of a historically significant existing park. Now, underlying those complex design challenges was the additional challenge of navigating the process of building a memorial on federal land in Washington, D.C. As you well know, a memorial sponsor must comply with three different statutory regimes and appear before at least four different approval, consulting, and advisory bodies, which comprise a total of 23 different voices, by my count, 12 of which are on this commission alone. And that doesn't even count the consulting parties and other public commenters in the NEPA in Section 106 processes. We heard from that multitude of stakeholders who, needless to say, do not always speak with a single voice. Over the course of some 45 commission presentations, interagency staff meetings, and what Section 106 consulting party meetings. And you've seen in the staff presentation to you just now and in prior submissions 
how we have endeavored to meet those sometimes conflicting challenges. It's taken us exactly three years to go from our initial design submission to this presentation, which I know to some sounds like a long time, but which I understand to be relatively short for a project <laughs> of this scope and complexity. And we've done so, I believe, with a relative absence of controversy. As frustrating as that process can be at times, we have learned and benefited from the guidance from this commission as well as the other stakeholders, and we have presented to you a better memorial design as a result. Our ability to meet those challenges before us in this time frame is due to the efforts and talents of a great many people, starting with our design people, and I ask them to stand when I acknowledge them, but led by our lead designer, Joe Weishar, who won our competition, supported by our architect of record, GWW Architects, led by John Gregg, and landscape architect, David Rubin Land Collective. And of course, our sculptor, Saban Howard, is not with us today. And to that note, what struck me about this whole process has been how much of it has been about the park and how little time relatively has been spent on the, on the, uh, on the sculpture itself. The sculptor is off and running. He's been sculpting since Labor Day. Uh, I encourage you, if you find yourself in the New York City area, to let us know. We'd be delighted to facilitate a visit out to his studio so you can see his work in process. You guys can sit. Um, but I also want to call out the staff of this commission, most notably Matthew Fliss, Diane Sullivan, Lee Webb, Elizabeth Miller, and Michael Sherman, as well as the staffs of the Commission of the Fine Arts and the National Park Service led by Mr. May, and the commissions themselves, of course. So with all that, I appreciate you for, you for indulging me today and for your contributions to this long overdue memorial. Uh, we look forward to completing this process and moving on to making it, to bringing it to realization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fountain. Appreciate the work that you all have been doing in collaboration with staff and, and all the stakeholders. Um, like to open up to any comments or questions at this time from the commission. Mr. Evan. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to thank the, the team for the design work. I think that it's come a really long ways from when we looked at this first years ago, where it was essentially going to gut this park and create a new memorial. And we've really moved on to kind of a, I think I called it at the time, a more of a restoration project and, and enhancing it. Um, and I just want to reiterate the thing that I've said uh, the past few times, too, and this might be more for the park service, but please, please, please do all you can to keep this, this pool running, to keep the water in there. <laughs> Um, there's so many other locations, I've said this before, that you walk around the city around here and there are water elements and they're just turned off, they're broken, they're not maintained. And I think that's a really a central feature here and if it's going to work, the water is really important. So um, I just make sure to keep that scrim on as much as you can to get that, that pool fixed up um, and don't let it, and, and just put, a, put aside resource to maintain this going forward. See down at FDR right now, you can see there's a lot of the water features that aren't always on. So I know it's a big undertaking to, to do that sometimes, but I think that's just such a central part here. So I'd really encourage um, uh, folks to make it work. And, but thanks for the, the design work. Other comments, questions? Um, I have a few. Commissioner May. Yeah, I just, uh, <coughs> Say uh, thank you to Mr. Cash, and also to note that we, um, I think we will be able to approach this park a little bit differently from others. Uh, and uh, Mr. Fountain actually has something to do with that. And we'll continue to work with uh, um, the World War One Centennial Commission to get this built, but then hopefully beyond that, uh, working with others to. Um, to make sure that this stays at the high level of restoration that we will see. I mean, this is one of those parks that we inherited, uh, not that we treated it any differently, but it's not one that we had originally designed. And we've been, it's been a struggle to maintain from the, from the very beginning. And of course, our ability to maintain these is highly uh, dependent on um, the funding we receive. And so hopefully we will receive sufficient funding to be able to do what we need to do. Anyone else to comment? I, I would like to uh, also compliment the, the work of the team. Um, this memorial has come a long way. Um, and I think this, the kind of uh, synergy of the landscape design with the memorial design and the combination of materials and water and so forth really all reinforce one another in a very, very positive way. The, 
connectivity and the kind of access and visibility of this memorial is something that's been an issue, I think, uh, in the past. And I think that you all have found amazing ways to try to open it up and at the same time give it kind of a, a procession uh, that uh, would, would invite visitors into the site. The, the kind of access from the points, the, the more accessibility from ramping. This is, there's a lot of grade on this site, which has to be considered and not a small thing to do. And I think you've done, a, done it in a, an amazingly seamless kind of way. Um, uh, I appreciate the decision about materials, um, the keeping the scrim, uh, you know, as a different kind of color and material, I think is critical to its overall success in the multi-use uh, ways that we anticipate seeing the space used over time. Um, so I really uh, thrilled by the by the work that the team's done. Um, I, uh, you know, I. I, I want to, I'm, I'm glad we're on this image because it is, the, there's one thing about this that I have continually uh, talked about here and it is those steps, uh, the, the seated steps or whatever we would call them, not the formal steps down into uh, the memorial. And it's the, it's the ledge at the bottom that I'm most concerned about. Um, I just visited the memorial again this morning because I wanted to see it one more time as we took up this discussion and uh, I, I worry that, you know, what's supposed to happen when you get to the bottom, if you, if you walk all the way down um, and, you know, are you, are we inviting people to fall in? I don't, or step in, have we had that happen much in the past when this was operating as a pool before? I'm assuming the pool depth is essentially the same as what it is today is that right yes yes um, so obviously I don't, I don't think we have to worry about a, a safety issue as much as just sort of the lead seems to want to invite you to go there and want to almost tempt whether you're going to fall in or not um, so anyway it's just something that uh, of all the things and I, I really uh, you know, the Belvedere, by the way, is such an inspiration, I think, in the way where it's strategically placed, how it will uh, both be a perch for uh, visitors to learn and, and witness uh, uh, what's, what this memorial is all about. Uh, it's a uh, it's sort of a where, it, where it's located and how it will draw people into it in sort of a magnetized kind of fashion, I think is brilliant. So uh, very, very excited and can't wait to attend the groundbreaking for this one. And then, of course, the actual ribbon cutting for this one. Commissioner Cash. Uh, I do have one more question that this slide remind me of. Uh, is What's the strategy with the, the pavers throughout the site? I know that, that these are a lot of those old Pennsylvania Avenue pavers that seem to not be easily replicated. I know there's a big chunk of them out in front of the uh, Department of Commerce building where it was they tried to replicate and it has fallen apart. So I mean, are, are, is it going to be new? Is it going to be trying to a new stone integrating with the old? What's the, the strategy, especially along Pennsylvania Avenue side? Good afternoon. My name is David Rubin uh, from Land Collective. We're the landscape architects involved in the project. Um, we actually, through great uh, stewardship on behalf of the competition winner found the original source for the Pennsylvania Avenue pavers and uh, feel that we will be able to uh, position that paving in such a way that it will be seamless in the context of the greater avenue. Um, in terms of the materiality of the remainder of the paving systems, they reflect what was uh, a better version of what was originally placed there. So uh, uh, resetting in such a way that there are uh, no trip hazards um, and uh, uh, replacement in kind uh, wherever possible for the materials. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? Commissioner May. I was just hoping to comment on the uh, your concern about the steps and people getting into the water. So the um, you know we, it's it's a difficult balance because people want to go to water and touch water and put their feet in it and walk in it and so on. Um, but what we have done, as I understand the, the, 
the practice now uh, at World War I is that uh, if people want to put their feet into the water, sit at the edge, something like that, we won't stop that. Um, but when people wade into it, we will stop that. Mm -hmm. So I expect the same sort of thing might occur here, that people would go up to it and might put their feet into it, and we won't stop that. Um, but uh, we'll certainly discourage anybody from walking Jumping around in it. Because yeah. you want to have the appropriate reverence and respect for the memorial. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting because the ledge at, at points today uh, doesn't, it's not <laughs> continuous. It's, but for this section along uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, or I don't know what, what this actual road is. It's, just, it's Pennsylvania also. It's all Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, this section, it is continuous, at least as it exists now. So I think uh, it's just something that uh, it is what it is, but uh, just curious how we're thinking about it. Okay. All right. I think sensing no uh, further comment, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the final site development plans for this project. So moved. And is there a second? Second. There's a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimously approved. I'd like to thank the World War I Centennial Commission and the project team for their continuing efforts to refine this uh, beautiful design and that honors our veterans of World War I. Uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, when this turns into a reality. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Okay. <clears throat> Looks like it takes a village. Uh, um, next agenda item 6B is for approval of comments on the concept plans for the Korean War Veterans Memorial Wall of Remem Remembrance. And I believe Ms. Lee will be giving her final presentation here in front of the commission as she moves on to uh, an exciting role with the General Services Administration. Wish you the best, Ms. Lee. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the Commission. The National Park Service has submitted the Korean War Veterans Memorial Wall of Remembrance for concept review. This project entails adding a wall to the existing Korean War Veterans Memorial to remember the names of the service members who did not return from the Korean War. As the Commission retreat last month, you learned about the different stages of review for a, commemorative, for a new commemorative work. This commemorative work project is a bit different because it is an addition to an existing memorial. Therefore, at this concept review, the Commission should be asking what are the elements of the proposed design, how does the design fit within the context, what are the differences in the design alternatives, and what is the proposed and if and is the proposed design appropriate for the site? The Korean War Veterans Memorial is located to the southeast of the Lincoln Memorial on West Potomac Park. The memorial site has a symmetrical relationship to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial site located on the north side of the reflecting pool. Dedicated in 1995, the memorial occupies 7.5 acres within Ash Woods. It is surrounded by Ash Road to the north, the U.S. Park Police Stables to the east, Daniel French Drive to the west, and Independence Avenue to the south. The existing Korean War Veterans Memorial composition has a strong geometry organized into two distinctive areas, a triangular field of service and a circular pool of remembrance. The memorial also includes a flag pole a granite triangle where the memorial theme is inscribed, a mural wall, the freedom is not free inscription wall, and law walls with inscriptions aligning with the visual access between the Lincoln and Jefferson Memorial. Here you can see pictures of existing conditions. The field of service is a sunny area characterized by the fragrant smell of juniper bushes. Among, this, among the low bushes, 19 stainless steel soldiers walk toward the American flag. In the background, a Polish mural wall includes faces of supporting troops overlapping with the reflection of the, of the sculpture. The Pool of Remembrance is a shaded and secluded circular plaza that fosters quiet reflection. 
The American flag is the focal point of the memorial. The circular fountain buffers the noise of the surrounding Independence Avenue traffic. The commemorative grove of linden trees provides shade as well as circulation and benches on the ground plane. In 2016, Congress enacted the Korean War Veterans Memorial Wall of Remembrance Act. This legislation authorized the Korean War Veterans Memorial Foundation to construct a wall of remembrance at the Korean War Veterans Memorial. The act required that the wall include a list of names of members of the armed forces of the United States who died in the Korean War as determined by the Secretary of Defense. The proposed wall will include a total of 44,574 names, including the U.S. and the Korean augmentation to the United States Army. The project has uh, six design guiding principles, man maintaining the integrity of the original memorial, minimizing the impact of the proposed wall from the National Mall, incorporating the new wall as if it had been part of the original design, limiting the area of names to less than the name area on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, providing a better edge to the circular plaza, and incorporating the desired lines of pedestrian travel from the memorial. So in order to address the design principles, NPS analyzed the Vietnam Veterans Memorial and determined that the name surface area for the proposed wall should be less than 2,600 square feet. The proposed text will be 7 16th inch high, organizing columns by service and rank. So NPS considers several design concepts for the wall of remembrance with differences in height, material, and composition that significantly change the character of the memorial and the national mall, created adverse visual impacts, and increased impervious surface. It was clear through the consultation process that all of these options had major issues and were therefore dismissed. I'm going to walk you through the alternatives that were considered but dismissed. So the first design included an eight foot tall wall, a glass wall that enclosed the pool of remembrance. The glass introduced a new material into the memorial. While transparent, it would still be highly visible and intrusive. A second option included approximately 30 walls radiating from the pool. The proposed walls are alternated between eight and six feet in height. Again, this alternative created significant visual impacts and cluttered the site. The next scheme replicated the Korean flag in plan view. Vertical walls ranging from six to eight feet will be positioned around the pool. This alternative also created visual impacts to the memorial and the national mall. Another option included a new plaza on the south side of the existing mural wall. It included several walls ranging from four to nine feet in height. This option was dismissed because it separated the commemorative experience from the rest of the memorial and did not have any relationship to the existing circulation. Given all of the, these different options, NPS has selected a low wall alternative as their preferred approach. So here is the preferred option, which consists of a low wall angled, a low angle wall surrounding an expanded circular plaza. It entails a low angle wall integrated into the landscape as shown in yellow, an expanded circular plaza shown in pink, two pedestrian paths shown in blue, and also rehabilitating the existing memorial. Here is a section through the, proposed, the, the pool of remembrance. You can see the existing conditions on top and the pro, and proposed conditions at the bottom. The radius of the plaza will be expanded by nine feet to provide circulation around the new curvilinear wall. The existing berm from the surrounding landscape will be raised from four to 10% to conceal most of the wall and maintain reciprocal views of the memorial and the national mall. Here is a view looking west towards the Lincoln Memorial. The proposed wall will have a length of 384 linear feet. Here is a view looking east towards the proposed U.S. Park Police stables. The wall will provide an enclosure to the memorial space. Here is a pedestrian view from Ash Road. You can see the berm concealing most of the wall. 
Here is a picture looking west from the flagpole. You can see the proposed wall of remembrance to the left behind the existing mural wall in here. Here is a view from the main memorial entry toward the American flag. You can see the raised berm behind the existing United Nations Corp. Here is another view. Uh, this is looking from the Southwest Memorial Entry. The new paving and wall will be constructed of the same granite used in the original memorial. As you can see, the paving will be larger to differentiate the new addition. So in general, we comment favorably on the preferred low wall concept because it is consistent with the memorial design, is integrated into the landscape, minimizes visual and environmental impacts to the National Mall while improving access and circulation. So our analysis is organized in four topics, as you can see listed here. The first topic is circulation. The only formal access to the memorial is from the west via two pathways shown in red. So the memorial internal circulation starts at the triangular field of service here along the United Nations wall. It continues around the circular pool of remembrance. From there, some visitors can sit on benches under the linden trees and walk along the path, the path next to the mural wall towards Daniel French Drive to the west. The existing pedestrian circulation will be maintained with the additional option of walking along the wall of remembrance. NPS proposes <coughs> two new connections to the memorial, one from Ash Road to the north and one from Independence Avenue to the south. Both connections will bring visitors directly into the circular pool of remembrance. As you can see, the proposed walkways leading directly into the pool of remembrance provide symmetry to the design. However, they may alter this quiet and secluded space and the sequence of the existing memorial. So the proposed connection from Ash Road will improve the visitor experience and connectivity of the memorial with the surrounding context, given Ash Road connects the Korean War Veterans Memorial to nearby memorials and attractions on the National Mall, including the soon-to-be-renovated U.S. Park Police tables located immediately to the east. The proposed connection from Independence Avenue may have less use because it is located in between the, the only two crossings on Independence Avenue, which already have or will have with the Stables Project formal paths to Ash Road. Visitors would likely follow these two paths to access the memorial from Ash Road, as opposed to walking along the more traffic prone Independence Avenue. Therefore, we request that NPS further evaluate how many visitors will be likely to, to access the memorial from the proposed Independence Avenue connection. The second topic is the proposed wall design. The proposed wall is consistent with the geometry of the existing low walls at the Korean War Veterans Memorial. So as you can see in this section, the proposed wall will have a granite frame around the perimeter here, a 16-inch granite mow strip in here, transitioning between the wall and the grass, and the wall will be 8 inches above the berm. The wall finish will be polished with sandblasted names to maximize contrast. Here is a view walking from the proposed pathway that connects Ash Road to the memorial. The raised berm conceals most of the wall while retaining views to the space under the linden trees and the freedom is not free wall. As the design evolves, we request that the applicant consider simplifying the wall profile to soften the transition into the landscape and maintain open views between the existing memorial components and the National Mall. We provide a mock-up on site of a segment of the proposed wall to evaluate how the reflective finish and angle impact glare and legibility, as well as visual impacts to the memorial and surrounding context. The third topic is landscape and visitor experience. The memorial's landscape design reinforces its formal composition. It is characterized by a commemorative space composed of two rows of linden trees around the pool of remembrance that create a circle of pleached trees and a triangular field of low juniper bushes emerging from the forest. Any changes to the landscape should be minimal and avoid competing with the memorial's formal landscape. 
So the memorial has limited seating opportunities given the size of the overall memorial site. There are currently seven benches under the bleached linden trees, as you can see here highlighted in red. So we recommend that the applicant provide a landscape plan that incorporates benches along the proposed walkway that connects Ash Road to allow for opportunities for rest and contemplation, and if possible in areas of shade, and low impact development features integrated into the proposed berm to comply with federal and local stormwater management regulations. Lastly, we request that the applicant provide a lighting plan and night views of the proposed wall consistent with the overall lighting design for the memorial that respects the hierarchy <laughs> of memorials, monuments in the, nation, in the nation's capital. Details showing the proposed improvements to the back side of the existing mural wall and how the wall of remembrance will terminate at the mural wall. And eye level views from Independence Avenue looking north to better understand the impacts of the proposed design. To conclude, the Executive Director's recommendation is for the Commission to comment favorably on the preferred low, low wall concept, and request an NPS further evaluate how many visitors would likely to access the memorial from Independence Avenue, request that the applicant consider simplifying the wall profile to soften the transition into a landscape, provide a mock-up of a segment of the proposed wall, recommend that the applicant provide a landscape plan with low impact development features, benches, um, request a lighting plan, details showing the proposed improvements to the back side of the existing mural wall and eye level views from Independence Avenue, with this, I conclude my presentation. NPS has provided a mock-up, physic a physical model, and also samples for your review. I'm happy to provide to answer any questions, and the applicant and design team are here as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lee, um, for a very informative and comprehensive presentation, um, as usual. Um, I'd like to open this up for comments or questions. Mr. Chairman, I would just say that this is a great job, well presented, and uh, I guess, and but particularly tell the staff, I'm very sorry to see you have to leave us. And I hope it will be, should be as rewarded as, as you deserve. Moving forward. Well, that's very right. nice of you. Well, if I mean, you're going to poach, you poach the best. Well, you know what? You, 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 you know how to do it. Yeah. Um, okay. So I... I'm not a fan of of these naming walls at all. I I um I get that it's what we do now and it's sort of de rigueur and I hope that we get over it soon because it's it, it it's it's become a bit of a cliche. And I kind of and I think it's it heads us off in a design direction that we will all uh, live to regret um, just because there's it, it, the what was so powerful at Vietnam becomes diluted every time it's repeated yep. and yet I understand now that it's become the standard and if your name the name of your loved one is not written down somewhere you feel slighted so we've created a problem that that needs to be fixed I think having said all that I think, and I'm not a fan of additions to f complete compositions, mm. um, and it should be avoided, especially to come back and do this. However, um, uh, having read up a little bit of, um, about the history of the war, which my father was in, um, uh, and never talked about, um, I think that that the design for the the addition is as sensitive um, and as fitting as it possibly could be. And I, whoever the design team was, I applaud you, because this is hard to do. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Simple is good. Thank you. Any other comments, Ms. Commissioner? I, uh, I I agree with with what's been said. Um, I think it it was done all very sensitively. I, I just there was one thing that struck me. I've I've two comments. One, if you could go to the slide where the, it's the view from the Southwest Memorial Entry, 
Um, I just feel, and it, in my deck it's number 27, but I don't know if that helps you. Yeah, that's what it is. I, I won't be here. Uh, yeah, I know it's a different number, but at least maybe it's near that. Yeah, that. so um, this is the one that it does feel like a, a little bit of a different experience uh, just because it, feel, there's like a, it feels like a slice coming right at, at me through, through the wall. And I just, I, I guess I'm interested in thinking, in, in hearing when it comes back how, how the design team is thinking about how this kind of creates a, two sides now to, to the memorial. You have that open. That, that's the existing. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> thank you. That's. I thought that was. Well, then, then never mind. Thank you, uh, thank you, Peter, thank you Commissioner May. The, my only other comment then is is really then on um, the new paths and just thinking about the tree plan. I noticed it looks like there might be trees in the way. So, in so far as the new landscape plan comes forward, if there are trees to be removed, uh, what what additions might be made? I think would be interested to hear. Thank you. I wouldn't mind commenting on that one my, just before I have my other comments. Uh, I happened to go by here this morning uh, also because I wanted to view, view this memorial also because it's not one that I've gone to often. Uh, it's, it's sort of a secret to me. Uh, it's tucked in on the, uh, say, the, the, the lesser pedestrian used side of, of the mall, in my opinion. Um, but uh, I was, and, and part of my curiosity had to do with how it was viewed from Independence Avenue and how you could access it and what the impact on the trees would be. And I was actually amazed at, even though this drawing shows sort of a forest, um, I was amazed at how I thought we could find a pathway through there that wouldn't have a lot of tree intervention, but it would be interesting to see whether the design team uh, agrees with me. But ultimately, um, uh, I think that the access to Independence Avenue would be a wonderful thing um, because it is such a secret. And I know that I, I heard the, the comments from staff about questions about the number of visitors but I could also imagine that if this were more of a inviting opening from Independence Avenue, that we might find more pedestrians using that side of the street and also wanting uh, access into what right now is a not uninviting, and there's really no reason to want to walk on that side of Independence Avenue, um, even though it has fewer curb cuts than the southern side of the street. Um, so I'd like to uh, imagine uh, this side of Independence Avenue as becoming a more uh, pedestrian uh, inviting kind of place where uh, we might see people crossing from Martin Luther King and coming across into the mall and being Invited. I know there will be another penetration at the horse barn uh, where we're we're renovating that as well. But uh, if if there's no reason to walk on something, then it's going to be hard for NPS to answer the question: How many visitors are going to uh, enter from this location? But if we could imagine and could create a more uh, inviting pedestrian experience along Independence Avenue, I think we would get more people along that route and we would get more visitors to this, what I think is somewhat a, a secret memorial and a very important one. I'll leave my comments there and come back on other things later. Um, is there any uh, anyone who could comment on the vision for pathway in terms of the impact on existing trees in the Ashwoods area? Good afternoon. I'm Mary Kay Lanzalotta with Hartman Cox Architects, part of the design team. So thank you for your comments, Commissioners. Um, <clears throat> part of the reason for creating both of these paths is there are desire lines right now uh, underneath the tree canopies, both to the southeast and to the northeast. Uh, it has created a, a problem, actually, for the Park Service. People uh, don't uh, honor, I'll say, the post and chain that is currently along Independence. And, um, or Ash Road for that matter, 
or around the pool of remembrance, and uh, people are climbing over that constantly. And so we think it's really to the benefit, not only for the grove of trees, uh, but for the long-term sustainability of ash wood to actually create those paths uh, that will uh, support the pedestrians. Since this memorial was built, as Ms. Lee indicated, there's been a lot of change to this portion of the mall. Um, and I think uh, these paths start to acknowledge uh, the evolution, the continual evolution of the site and um, build upon the experience the visitors currently have and will be a more welcoming uh, path rather than trampling uh, these poor tree roots uh, and mm -hmm. the canopy. We, we believe we can find a path. We have an arborist on our team that is helping us uh, make those selections. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, maybe a path that will minimize any loss of trees? That is certainly our objective. Yeah, okay. Uh, both to the southeast and to the northeast. All right, Commissioner Trueblood, does that respond to your question? That's, it does, and I, I agree with you. I mean, I think this could be quite additive to the memorial. I've only experienced it through kind of the linear um, path in the as you have in the red arrows right there. Um, and I, I do think, obviously, there's a, a desire um, and a demand uh, for other ways of accessing this memorial. Thank you. Other comments or questions? I have some, but I will, I'll wait. Commissioner May? Well, I was going to respond to some of the issues that have come up. Um, first of all, I would say to uh, Commissioner Wright's comment about walls of names and the extent to which they are required in, in memorials like this, and um, I think we all sense that that's not desirable in every circumstance. Uh, and in fact, uh, other memorials very deliberately steer away from that. So for example, at Desert Storm, they will not be listing names and they're very clear about that. I think that's very important. Um, I think another thing that, um, that has come up is this, uh, is the notion that this part of the mall has changed, but I think also memorials change. And, and as much as we try to predict how people will uh, enter and exit and experience the memorials, it often works out to be a little bit different. And so, for example, at um, Vietnam Veterans Memorial, it was originally designed with a grass buffer between the wall and the walkway. And it became very clear very early on that we could not keep people from stepping over that and touching the wall. And so that, mall, that memorial was adapted. Now, World War II, we did, uh, it was a different circumstance, but we had to, um, an area where we did not think people would be walking at all became a place where people walked. And this band of paving that sort of flank it um, had to be widened because of the trampling of the grass that, that surround it. Uh, so, it, and as much as we try to control how people experience these things and, <laughs> and go into our vast supply of post and chain and start <laughs> deploying it everywhere, it's, it's not big enough to truly keep people from doing things uh, and stepping over it, uh, nor do we want it to be that, um, that much of a preventive measure. Um, we're trying to suggest to people that you should go this way, not that way, and we do our best with that and live with the consequences. In this circumstance, I think one of the things that, that is probably happening is that there are many people who are ascending um, uh, through one of the approach paths and then electing to leave from the circle, from around the pool of remembrance. And there are probably as many people leaving from that point as there are um, approaching to it. Um, because I think it's a little bit more, when you get to that point, it's like, oh, well, why don't I walk that way to Ash Road, and then I can go to, the, to World War II faster, or I can go down Independence to Martin Luther King faster. So um, I, I think that it, this is a, a sensible uh, kind of approach, and it certainly has to be done sensitively, and we have to be um, careful with the placement of trees and the placement of, of the path. I'm not sure that the paths themselves uh, really accommodate or will accommodate um, seating um, or shade, which those sort of seem a little bit contradictory. Um, but we'll certainly look at that. Uh, we, we are looking at the question of whether we have enough seating within the, the memorial itself uh, as well. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm so thrilled with the 
design solution as it has been developed at this point for what I thought was going to be an, uh, a, an, an incredibly difficult adaptation uh, that I am highly confident that the design team will be able to navigate the waters and get us th through um, and resolve any, uh, any of these questions raised by the staff or by the commission today. Thank you, Commissioner May. I, I just want to follow up. I, I, I agree that this is a incredibly sensitive intervention uh, into this uh, memorial space and uh, compliment the design team as well. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, if we could look at slide 56, I think it is. Yeah. So this there's a lot going on right here. At, uh, there's a lot of ambition with this corner of the of the uh, wall of remembrance and where it connects to the mural wall. And I feel like we're gonna we're gonna add a, an, an inscription, as I understand it, on the back side, the south side of the wall, and we also terminate the. The wall of Remembrance right at the mural wall, um, which to me both creates uh, the possibility for a sort of a dead end corner on the one hand and the other uh, a conflict potentially with those who might want to be reading the inscription while others are reading names along the wall of remembrance. So to me this is something I'd really like the team to look at further how we resolve that intersection. Uh, what's, what's so nice about the, I, I, I know you don't want to create an opening there that then would invite people to walk along the south side of the wall, so I don't think we're looking for that. Um, but what's so nice about the way you have proposed the openings in the Wall of Remembrance for the two new pedestrian pathways is that uh, it has the potential, because I'm going to comment on that in a second, but it has the potential for a very elegant kind of natural uh, uh, entrance into, into the circular wall. So uh, but I feel like it, it fails at that, at that moment in, in, the, in the design. Um, the other thing, I guess, uh, is if you could go to 50, please. This is where the berm, and you, you commented on this, uh, Ms. Lee, in your comments as well, the, where the um, sidewall of the berm is trying to sort of transition and, uh, and absorb the berm, and, and I'm sure there, there needs to be a lot more design work done here, uh, but, uh, you know, this can't be it exactly, right? We need to work on something that feels like it belonged there. This feels like certainly an afterthought at this point, um, and um, it is an afterthought, but we need to make it feel like it's not an afterthought, ultimately, um, so that you know decades from now people will come and feel as though this was always a part of this. Um, the, the, the thing I like most about the, the way of all the options that were explored and what I like about this is how it protects the sight lines which are such an important part of this memorial. Um, it's such an elegant and uh, defined um, uh, you know kind of orientation as you use it. And, uh, Commissioner May as you talked about people leaving you arrive there and then like where do I go I don't really want to go back because I just experienced the way you're supposed to go, which is to go in. And so this kind of release to be able to go to either side is going to be a really nice and welcome thing. Um, and of course, we want to welcome people coming from Ash Road and Independence Avenue also into this. So overall, uh, I think these are minor things that you all can easily address. I just want to make sure we reinforce those points when we see it back again. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All right. Um, so, is there a motion to approve the? Oh, oh, 
I did oh, have one Wright. question. Uh -huh. um, about, she thinks best when she's typing. No, I had a question about this letter from Mr. Barker about the inaccuracy of the names, which is one of the things that's a problem with these walls. He claims that there's over a thousand errors um, <clears throat> and that the number of, of, of um, names is wrong and so forth. So I'm assuming that that, that is going to be resolved. Should I assume that? Uh, Ma'am, my name's uh, Colonel Richard Dean. I'm the vice chairman of the Korean War Veterans Memorial Foundation. The way the law is written is the names that are going to be inscribed on this wall have to be provided by the Department of Interior to our foundation, and they get it from the Department of Defense. It's up to the Department of Defense to provide the, uh, yeah. the names to us. And the Barker brothers have the opportunity of providing that data if they want to release it to the Department of Defense, but right now they want to be paid for that da data. And I'll leave it at oh. that. Oh. This is a shakedown? Could be. Kind of? Oh, wow. Well, I'm glad they, I asked. They've um, spent about 50 years with this database, and they their life is built into this database they have. They want to be paid for it. I'll leave it at that. Okay, so, but but since since no one's going to, I don't, I mean, the drama and intrigue, <laughs> notwithstanding. Can't resist. The, 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 uh, this is, this is part of the problem with an undertaking this, like so, this, so is the accuracy and literally it'll be set in stone. So if, if the Barker brothers are <laughs> trying to get paid for it, well, I, Okay, that's one thing, but how will DOD and Interior collaborate to, to ensure accuracy without the participation of the Barker brothers? Mr. May? The legislation states that the DOD shall provide the list of names one time. We do not, and we have not in the past with other memorials, gotten into the business of vetting any names. So it won't be a collaboration. We will look to receive that list from them. And the legislation was written specifically this way to avoid the, the process that has been playing out at Vietnam where people right. continue to want to add names to it. Uh, now, there are reasons why names get added, and they do get added, but yeah. we rely on DOD to provide those names. We rely on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Foundation to actually add the names. Um, but, you know, th again, because this was further in the past and the records were not as clear, we, we actually insisted on this being in the legislation to make sure that what we got was one list at one time, and that is what it will be. I just, you know... I leave it up to DOD to make sure that it's correct. Got that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll give you an inference. If you're an Air Force uh, bomber and you flew from some island that wasn't near Korea, but you were flying there, the Barker brothers would consider that a loss from the Korean War, even though they weren't in the battle area. And that's some of those boundaries and definitions that Department of Defense has to uh, decide on to, to fulfill this list. And so one more question. So at what, so at, at, it, it, at what point will the list, the final list be we, we have submitted. I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to I mean, look to my fellow commissioner I guess to answer I, that. I, I think the accuracy matters here and yes. and so is it going to be or so are they going to deliver they haven't made the list already final so our foundation has submitted three letters to the secretary of defense to provide the list of names to us they still haven't provided us the list of names yet if, if we need to weigh in to try to push that along certainly we would help push uh, the Department of Defense to provide the list of names that they're required to provide under law. But I, I think that there will be time between now and when the um, memorial is constructed to get it all done and finalized. And you know, I mean, we can look at a draft list of names whenever that's ready or whatever, but we want to, you know, at a certain point we will want to have that final list, and that's what 
um, will be needed in order to construct it. And and one last thing, I swear. So in the design, is there adequate room hmm. for addition? If 20 years from now, it's discovered that DOD made a mistake and left a bunch of people out. If yes. I might say, I, I have advised the design team that even though the legislation says there'll be one list of names and one time, that you never know what the Congress may decide in the future. Right now, they are debating a bill that would add a significant number of names to the Vietnam right. Memorial, and we don't have room for them. Right. That's so, why I'm asking. So we, I have advised them to make sure that we plan for some additional space. Yeah. Hard to know how much. Mr. By the way, next month, we'll because be bringing another memorial wall with names. That needs exactly. to be enlarged. And then I mean then we'll then we'll have a billboard over, you know, to the to the north and you know, you know I mean, okay. it's we, just we that. we'll do everything okay. we can to plan for that possibility. Right. Yeah. We, okay. Right well, this is outside of our right. control. we we understand the process. Thank you for that clarifying. I'd like to look for a motion to uh, approve the comments on concept design for uh, so moved. this memorial wall. Second. Thank you. All in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Lee. Good luck to you. I we'll miss you. Okay. We have... Thank you for all the beautiful exhibits. Very helpful. Hi, Brian. Um, we have two information presentations uh, to come. First up is a presentation on the plans by Johns Hopkins University for the building now used by the museum and located within the area covered by the Pennsylvania Avenue plan and design guidelines. Ms. Lit Ms. Ridgely will walk us through this. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commission members. We have an interesting information presentation for you today from Johns Hopkins University uh, regarding the conversion of the museum building located at 555 Pennsylvania Avenue. This ties into one of the topics from your Commission retreat related to the regulation of private facilities. As you may know, Johns Hopkins is in the process of purchasing the building and transforming it into their new consolidated Washington campus for advanced academic programs. They're here today to share some background information on the project and early design work on the building renovation. Before they get started though, I would like to briefly share some information on the upcoming review process related to this project as it's a little bit different than most projects that the Commission sees. As you may know, land within the Pennsylvania Avenue Development Corporation boundary or PADC boundary, including the private property located north of the avenue, is subject to a congressionally mandated review for conformance with the PADC's Pennsylvania Avenue plan general guidelines, and square guidelines. The boundary established by an act of Congress in 1972 is shown in orange here on the screen. Most of the time, the projects conform with the existing plan and guideline language, and staff writes up a delegated EDR. But sometimes the proposed changes require amendments to the plan and square guidelines. And this has happened a few times in the recent past, uh, including the FBI site in 2015-16, 1301 Penn in 2009, the former Spy Museum site up at 8th and F Streets back in 2004, and the museum at an earlier date uh, back in 2003. As Mr. Fliss noted in the World War I Memorial presentation, this area also overlaps with the Pennsylvania Avenue National Historic Site. Uh, there are also three historic districts and the Shipstead Loose Act in this area. So what exactly will be amended here? The PDC developed three levels of planning guidance, and we're looking to amend two of them. The first level is the PADC plan. It provides general guidance on how to redevelop and maintain land within the PADC boundary. The first part of the PADC plan includes area-wide planning principles such as land use, transportation systems, a uniform streetscape, and landscape. The second part of the plan includes an evaluation of the area on a block-by-block -block basis and included potential development scenarios at a high level. Its last comprehensive update was back in 1990. So the Commission will review proposed amendments to the section on square 491 at 555 Pennsylvania Avenue in December. 
Now, the second level are the general guidelines. These highlight the need to employ best design practices for things like urban design, historic preservation, pedestrian circulation, and others. Its guidance is applied to the entire PADC development area. And there are no proposed amendments to this document. Now, at a more detailed site scale, the SQUARE guidelines evaluate the SQUARE and its surrounding context for site-specific guidance on el elements like building envelope, build two lines, the height, land use, curb cuts, et cetera. Uh, and the SQUARE guidelines are used in conjunction with local zoning regulations to provide the most guidance for development. Now, the Commission will review proposed amendments to the SQUARE guidelines in spring of 2020. So these amendments are all triggered by the proposed change in the overall land use. In this case, we're shifting from a museum use over to an educational or an institutional use. Uh, and the building design, which includes changes to the interior gross square footage and the building's facade also trigger that proposed change. Now the commission plays a key role in this process and we're going to break it up into two parts. Part one will cover amending the plan and will be coordinated with a concept review of the site and building re renovations in December. Uh, now, as I mentioned earlier, the plan contains more general language on the development of Square 491, which actually also includes the Canadian Embassy. If approved, GSA will transmit that plan amendment to Congress, where it has 60 days to review the change. Uh, if no action is taken, the amendment is approved. Part two of this effort will cover amending the Square guidelines, along with preliminary and possibly final review of the site and building renovations in spring of 2020. Uh, these do not require commission, or I'm sorry, congressional approval. I hope this provides some information on the review process. I'm also happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, but without further ado, I would like to hand things over to Mitch, uh, Mr. Mitch Badano, the Chief Real Estate Officer for Johns Hopkins, uh, and Richard Alcott, Design Partner at Enneat Architects, to share an overview on this important project. Thank you so much. Uh, commissioners, thank you for hearing us today. Your staff has been a pleasure to work with, and we greatly appreciate their support so far. Uh, we are very excited to be here today to present the revisioning of 555 Pennsylvania Avenue to the new home and DC Academic Center for Johns Hopkins University. Uh, we have a long history in DC, including three buildings that we currently own on Mass Avenue near DuPont Circle, um, as was mentioned, that house uh, the SICE program, Krieger School of Advanced Academic Programs, and the Cary Business School. Um, these are all graduate programs that we plan to consolidate to this location. Uh, with that, I am just going to cover a brief bit of context. Um, the building, as you know, is on Pennsylvania Avenue, right at 6th Street with C Street behind it. Uh, just a couple of perspective views of the location. I'm sure you all know it uh, very, very well, so I will be brief here. Uh, but just talking about the goals here, um, Again, we've been in the district for a long time, and we've looked at our future, whether we renovate the existing buildings, move somewhere else, consolidate. Uh, nobody is happy that the museum is closing, um, but when this opportunity came along and it was uh, listed for sale, it, it really just became a great opportunity to anchor this location, and we look at this as a 100-year decision uh, to make this our academic center. So. We are space constrained where we are today, not so much for classrooms, but convening space, flexibility. Um, so this, this creates a completely different environment to be able to host events from Baltimore, vice versa, increase those connections. Um, obviously create a collaborative learning environment and uh, provide flexibility for the future of higher ed. Uh, so the design objectives. Um, Obviously a monumental area and location, and we went back to the original building architect. So Enead Architects is a successor firm to the Polchak Partnership, who designed the original building. Uh, we partnered uh, with the Smith Group as well, a local DC architect, um, to come up with this design, and you will hear from them. But obviously the historic context, the scale, the materiality, the, the local image are so important, and you'll hear from the architects themselves about that. But I want to focus on this last one, alive and extend the hours along Pennsylvania Avenue. We feel like we really bring a different use um, to this area and are actually really excited about the location for that reason, uh, especially the open space across the street and the fountain. And you'll see in the design, we've tried to design an entrance to the building that we feel like connects those. We think it will be used by students, faculty, visitors, and others off hours. Um, you know, again, we have a lot of night programs, weekend programs, uh, so we're really excited about having that space nearby. I just want to point out this was a very purpose-built uh, facility. 
Uh, what works well as a museum does not really work well for higher ed space. So uh, light was purposefully restricted into this building to create exhibit space. So a lot of our design is opening up the facade to get more light into the building. And as you can see or may know, the entire back of the building on C Street is a residential building that, that is part of this project as well. Um, but it doesn't allow the ability to get light in from the back of the building at all. And then just to the east of it is the Canadian Embassy. So that's a blank wall um, as well. So focused on the facade, getting light into the building, opening up the space, and making it possible um, for the future of higher ed. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Richard Olcott with NEAD Architects uh, to talk further about design and happy to ask, answer any questions later. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think you've all seen, you, you know well, this building. Um, and I, maybe I should uh, just make a few comments on the, as was mentioned, this is obviously a purpose-built building for uh, a major museum program. Uh, and uh, a large part of the original idea of this building was this great big window, which allowed you to literally see into the building and see the, the, the big screen inside. Um, that actually represents a lot of real estate, that big window, that big opening in the facade. Uh, I think they paid a terrible price for all of that lost square footage. Um, and so that's one of the things I think that our clients, uh, Johns Hopkins, realized that there was a lot of really fantastic space that could be had there. Uh, so I'm going to just go through the various changes uh, here that we are proposing. Uh, and first and foremost, one of them is actually to infill that window um, because it does not serve the purposes of this new institution. Um, and so we really, what we're proposing to do is primarily do work on the, I'm going to call it the first bar. You see the number one there. There are three big kind of linear bars that make the diagram of this building. Um, so firstly, to infill that large opening, and then you'll see uh, to reclad the, that volume itself, which is currently almost entirely glass uh, in stone. Uh, and I'm going to talk more about that in, in a moment. Uh, all while optimizing the daylight, as Mitch mentioned, because actually, although it is glass, a lot of it is not transparent glass. Um, we are also proposing to reclad, the, to redo the fins on the second bar so that they have more to do with that in the first. And in the third one, to infill uh, those small, there are two little small balconies that are let into the facade. You see the little squares on the top there. Uh, and also to uh, extend in plan the elevator bulkhead that you see at the very top of the building. We're putting an entirely new elevator core in the building because currently the museums were, their elevators take you from the basement to the roof, you know, and then you walk all the way down. Um, that is obviously not a diagram that works for an academic building. It's got hundreds of people moving between floors. Um, and then lastly, uh, and most importantly, I think for today, we want to talk about the, the urban condition of this building and the streetscape. Um, we are proposing to relocate the entrance, which is currently in the center of the facade, underneath the cantilever, um, and move it east towards the Capitol and make it larger, more apparent, more welcoming. Um, and actually build out a, a, a plinth uh, that you'll see in a lot more detail in a moment. Currently, the building, you have to go in and go up 18 inches to get in. Uh, the first floor slab is slightly above the street. Um, so we, and we're also proposing to open up a lot of the space to the east where it's wider to create a new uh, publicly accessible cafe space and really try and generate more street life than, than the building currently uh, provides. Um, so, let me go a little farther. And, um, and on the inside, this is a section through the, through the building. What you see is actually we're, we're uh, reordering a lot of the floors and actually removing some and adding others um, in order to get better and more flexible and appropriate ceiling height space for an academic institution. Uh, we are, as I mentioned, infilling the big window you see on the, on the right with new slabs. Uh, and we are maintaining but slightly reshaping the very large atrium which becomes the kind of central focus of the building. Uh, as you can see here, we are calling it kind of a vertical quad in which all of the different programs um, of the building actually kind of present themselves on that atrium um, and also provide a lot of daylight, as Mitch mentioned, to try and bring light into that space and get light deep, uh, deep back into the, into the building. So um, on the ground floor here, as I mentioned, you can see 
And you'll see this in a lot more detail in a moment, but uh, there is a new and very wide entrance in the center slid to the, to the east towards the capital. Uh, we are proposing to have a very shallow kind of feathered ramp that you see where it says welcome zone there um, that takes you up slightly and then a set of very shallow steps. Um, and then you enter the building in a much wider vestibule than, than you do currently. And you see to the right uh, where they are shown in, in purple there, uh, public access into the building to a, a new cafeteria, cafe kind of food service facility and a lot of hopefully seating on the sidewalk itself to create a kind of much more lively condition than, than currently uh, exists. Also on the left, um, some sort of program that is, that is still being defined that is very visible and very uh, accessible to the public uh, and hopefully more vibrant. And currently, as you know, there's all of those newspapers that are, that are wonderful to look at, but you can't see into the building beyond them, really. Um, so there's a, there's a significant amount of change. You can see in, inside the building, there is a new elevator core straight, straight to the back. Um, as I go forward here, so um, in terms of the facade treatment, this is sh a diagram showing the, how the building was originally conceived so that the first bar lines up with the building to the west where the Capitol Grill is, and the second bar is aligned with the Canadian Embassy uh, to its east, uh, and that is not changing in any way. In fact, really the only change to the bulk at all that I mentioned is one, the infill of the window, and two, the very small addition um, to the elevator bulkhead on the roof. And you'll see here, same thing is true in the elevation. All of those alignments that were originally created when it, this building was done 12 or more years ago, uh, it's carefully aligned with the Canadian Embassy on its first setback and its third low. setback, and also the third one, which, which touches the top of the National Gallery set uh, height across the street. All of that remains in place. Um, in terms of materials, we've, uh, we're very interested in trying to uh, take our place on Pennsylvania Avenue um, among a, a number of very distinguished buildings and trying to adapt a palette that would be uh, contextual and be uh, neighborly to that. So we've been looking carefully at using actually Tennessee marble if we are able to. Um, there's an ongoing discussion with that quarry. Um, which is, as you all know, the same stone as the East Building and the West Building of, of the National Gallery. Um, and then various other materials that are intended to create a kind of warm palette that has uh, very much to do with the institutional nature uh, and stone nature of Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, going a little closer, you'll see here, um, this is a detail of the stone wall we are proposing, as I mentioned, to clad that first bar in stone and, and also a glass that has a copper inner layer, um, again providing kind of warm color. Currently the building has a lot of green and very cool colors on it, which we found to be maybe not as, uh, as contextual as it could be. So this is all really in the service of trying to, to fit in better than, than we do now. Um, so this is what that proposal looks like. Uh, and there is still a conversation, by the way, I should add we did go to, uh, to the Commission of Fine Arts two weeks ago and received a, a concept approval conditional on uh, further exploration of the actual stone type and finish. Um, and so we're still, we're still working on that, but in general it was very enthusiastically received. Um, and this has to do with the, the, the major move here is to kind of to rethink the big window and create a, a big aperture which really references itself uh, as it did before to the Canadian Embassy and its monumental uh, aperture and raking a much a big gesture that is down the avenue uh, to the Capitol. You see a floating volume in there which is a very big gathering space that's part of the program. Uh, that will be a flexible um, meeting room, theater, gathering space uh, that will be a, really a, one of the, part of the heart and soul of, of the program. And you can also see, you'll see in, in more detail, the plinth that I described uh, that, that extends out slightly uh, from under that cantilever. Uh, as I go forward here, I can show you a few other views here showing a little more zoomed in from the other corner, looking at the corner entrance, um, sliding it down and making it much more apparent than it is now, and, and, and opening it out to this new public plaza space that will have cafe um, uh, facilities in it, which you see there to the very right in the image. And then I think, so um, 
a word, a little, few more words are now in detail on the, on the entrance. Here's the existing condition, and, and certainly it's true, it's a, where's, where's the door? It's a little hard to find. Um, that is, it is between the newspapers there in the center. Um, and it should also be noted, I mean, this was actually a design very much predicated on the idea that there are lines of people that have to go through security and get a ticket and do all those sorts of things. So in this building, you enter into that rather dark opening. You'll see here in plan in a moment. Um, there where it says 555, there's a recessed entrance. You walk into that, that uh, small overhang, dark, the outside space through a vestibule, and then you go right and you go left and you go up a ramp and go through metal detectors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're proposing to kind of untwist that sequence so that you can go straight into the building, it's much more apparent, and actually pull out uh, the, the, a plinth so that it becomes a more welcoming and gracious way to enter the building than it currently is. Um, thinking carefully about the sidewalk all, all the while here, and we just wanted to, to talk about that condition. If you see in orange, I mean in yellow rather, on the top you see in, in the larger context what actually happens, although the sidewalk gets very wide, the effective width of it isn't really that at all because the embassy has a phalanx of planters all the way around it that are 40 some feet away from the building. That's their security perimeter where you are heavily discouraged from walking. So the, the effective sidewalk where it says A and B there is 14 foot 8, which is the clear distance between the planters and the tree pits that are out by the street. Same is true if you keep going east, then they have a gate over their driveway. And if you kept going farther east to the, to the park there, it has a flight of steps all the way along at the same 14 foot eight. So what we're proposing is to, and you can see also in the dark blue, the cantilever, that's the line of the building above the, that is cantilevered out. And then when you cross the street to the west, it actually gets a, a little narrower, the effective width there uh, in front of the Capitol Grill at 601. So um, here now you see this is something we were looking at as an idea of a, a precedent, which is a very wide and shallow plinth that, that takes you up very slightly and then you enter the building in a much more welcoming way than, than the way it currently uh, is configured um, under a big overhang again. So this is what, this is now the proposed solution and you see uh, a much wider vestibule with uh, four pairs of doors that take you in uh, either from the east, uh, from the plaza, or from the south, uh, from, from the avenue itself. Um, a pair of planter plinth walls on either side of some very long and shallow uh, steps there. There are three steps up. And then as you get to the western side, there's a shallow ramp because what's actually happening in the street is sloping very gradually down to the west uh, from the east. Um, so there's a very commodious plinth that is pulled out, but it's still maintaining the width of that sidewalk all the way across, aligning with the planters from the embassy, and then under the cantilever above you and into a, a glass vestibule. Which I think, so here you see that in slightly more detail. The property line in red, uh, the overhang of the building in blue, uh, and how, and so those planters are actually out there at the same line, again, as the one that is coming from the avenue, um, from the embassy next door, um, and a very wide and gracious plinth to stand on before we enter the vestibule in the building itself. Um, and that, this is what that might look like. Um, the stair tower exists and will remain, the glass stair tower, but the new uh, front bar of the building reclad in uh, hopefully Tennessee marble um, and with a very Nice place to sit, to gather um, uh, on the front there, uh, the steps to the left, and a very shallow ramp where you see the two people walking to the, to the right, almost level, actually. Uh, and then here, you see that again from the west side looking east, uh, and something much more visible looking in through the glass there to see much more activity and, and life inside the building than, than currently uh, one, one can do. And with that, I think, Mitch, maybe you want to say a few words about the, the schedule. 
Don't go far. Okay. <laughs> so we were asked just to talk briefly about uh, schedule for the project. So, so obviously we are, we are here in October. Uh, now we do plan to go back to CFA uh, again just to work through the facade comments we received and are sure we are good for their future approval when we submit building plans. Um, and then we have uh, a formal uh, hearing with a requested action from, from this group in December. Um, so the January CFA, that will be optional depending on how the second uh, review goes. Um, and then obviously working with you all to finalize the preliminary and final square guideline review, uh, hopefully by the spring, actually in for building permit. And we plan to acquire the building uh, sometime this summer and start construction very shortly thereafter. And it will take about two and a half years to do a significant amount of work uh, on the building before we are moving folks over. So thank you very much and happy thank to you. answer any questions. Cheers. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank Good you. to see you, Mitch. Um, I, uh, any comments, questions at this time? This is a very ambitious undertaking, to be sure. Yes. I just wondered, uh, is the, uh, the uh, space you now use on Mass Avenue going to be combined here also? So we're going to consolidate all the programs from Mass Everything. Avenue here. Okay. And our intent is actually to uh, likely sell the buildings on Mass Avenue thereafter. Um, it was a little bit hard to follow some of the description of the plan and so forth, and, and uh, appreciate uh, your information. Uh, uh, but you know, understanding the entryway and the plinth, I don't know if there's a way that we'll get to see materials in advance so we can look at them in the future before we see hear you know hear your presentation uh, would be beneficial. Uh, because there's a lot going on in this building, um, and the uh, uh, I'm I'm you know this is such a dramatic space uh, in a very important location, and I I can feel the weight of your decision making as you're trying to balance uh, all of the aspects of function and form and design, um, and we'll. Uh, I know that we're going to be very interested in how you resolve all that in in, uh, in your concepts going forward. Any other questions or comments? No. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We so appreciate much. the time and uh, the information at this stage. Okay. Thank Good you luck. very much. Okay. And uh, the last item on the agenda is an, also an information presentation on the Arlington National Cemetery Southern Expansion, another very important uh, undertaking here in in this region. Mr. Mr. Hart will give the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, I wasn't sure how um, ambitious your your walk was this uh, this morning. So I wasn't <laughs> sure if you got a. I didn't go to this one. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'd probably get run over if I had a chance. Well, you know, it's you know, it's you never know. It could have been a very uh, you know he brisk did, walk he for did you. A step count on Pennsylvania Avenue. Well, well, I didn't mean to go any further. The Korean War Memorial. This is you know, go across the Memorial Bridge. And you're, you're just about. <laughs> I'll, I'll probably hit it next time. <laughs> um, so uh, good afternoon, members of the commission. Um, the Arlington National Cemetery representatives are here today to present an overview of the Southern Expansion Project. Uh, which is located, uh, of course, at Arlington National Cemetery in Arlington County, Virginia. Uh, this presentation is in anticipation of this project being formally submitted to the Commission for review by the end of this year. So uh, this is the second of two recent expansion projects at the cemetery. Uh, the first was the Millennium, uh, Millennium Project, which the Commission approved back in 2013. Uh, this 23-acre site included approximately 22,000 new burial spaces. The Millennium Project, uh, which you see here in the uh, northwestern portion of the Arlington National Cemetery, uh, took several years to complete, and it opened in September 2018. The Southern Expansion Site, which is also shown at the bottom of this slide, um, is uh, located just south of the existing, um, the southern portion of the existing 
624-acre uh, cemetery property. The uh, cemetery, the Arlington National Cemetery, cemetery folks, uh, the staff note that the, this expansion will increase the cemetery burial capacity by 40 to 60,000 first internment spaces. And just for your information, first internments uh, refer to the first member of a family laid to rest at one of the burial spaces at the cemetery. So um, as you may be aware, the um, southern expansion site was the, uh, uh, at least a portion of it, was the former home of the Navy Annex Building, which is shown here. You can actually see the um, uh, Air Force Memorial uh, in the, uh, on the image on the right. The Washington Headquarters Services transferred this land to the U.S. Army uh, in 2012. Uh, the building, the Navy Annex Building, was demolished, and the site is currently vacant. So um, this is the site uh, which is outlined with this dotted line. Um, it is, as you can kind of tell, uh, divided by a number of roadways. In order to allow for a larger contiguous land area for burials, the cemetery expansion project will necessitate changes in the existing roadway configuration. And to put that in a little context, you really wouldn't want to have any burial uh, space um, uh, uh, of any of that land to be isolated from the rest of the cemetery. So um, this uh, uh, project will require a change in the current land ownership, particularly with Southgate Road, which you see identified here, kind of in the middle of the slide, and uh, Columbia Pike, which um, kind of cuts through the, uh, the side. And I'll show those in a little bit more detail. Landowners uh, in this area include the federal government, um, uh, the Department of the Army. The area in yellow is the former Navy Annex site. Uh, you see Arlington National Cemetery, which is actually the area that's kind of pink, purplish, uh, on the top of the, uh, of the site, and the uh, Air Force Memorial, um, which the Air Force has a 50-year permit um, from the Army uh, for the memorial site. The um, state government also has uh, some property here. This is the Virginia Department of Transportation. Um, you see the area that's kind of in orange uh, in the bottom left-hand portion of this site, which is the west. Um, there is a, 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 a VDOT, Virginia D the Department of Transportation, salt dome. Um, and then finally, the local government um, has a number of roadways, uh, Southgate Road, Columbia Pike, and so uh, South Joy Street that uh, cut through the site. Um, and as the project uh, is reliant on the Columbia Pike uh, realignment, uh, discussions concerning the transfer and, co and compensation terms uh, for this land uh, have been ongoing for several years with Arlington County and VDOT, and this is, uh, these are still ongoing. Columbia Pike is a major connection point um, into Pentagon City, which is to the south of this, and Crystal City from the rest of Arlington County. Um, if you're not aware, 395 actually kind of um, makes a, somewhat of a barrier for getting uh, into um, uh, both Crystal City and Pentagon City, and Columbia Pike provides that, uh, that, that access. Um, so the realignment here, which is uh, shown in white, uh, has been an integral part of, the, uh, of this project. This realignment is a result of an, of an extensive conversation between the Army and various st stakeholders, including Arlington County and, and VDOT. This roadway is now part of, the, um, of a defense access roadway project, um, and you, that's really what you're seeing here. The portions of the road, road network that will be removed are uh, kind of hatched. This uh, defense access roadway project has its own process that is being overseen by the Federal Highway Administration, uh, and this will need to be submitted for a commission review in the future. So um, with that kind of background, I'd like to welcome Mr. Greg Schwederman, um, who is the senior project manager with HNTB, the consultant for the project, who will provide an overview of the project design focusing on the major land use changes for the cemetery, the multimodal corridor through the site, um, top topographic challenges with the site, and the, uh, the new entrance into the, uh, into the cemetery. Thank you, and welcome, Mr. Uh, Schwederman. Thank you, Carlton. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity uh, to introduce the project to the commission, and we want to thank Arlington National Cemetery and the U.S. Corps of Engineers for trusting us with this tremendous responsibility. Uh, this truly will be a transformative project for this area. Uh, as we go through it, Carlton already stole much of my thunder on all the major components, but we'll go over the program overview, 
Uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how the program's evolved. Uh, we started this process five years ago after a master plan. Uh, so I believe it was Mr. Fountain said the years he's had into it, he's probably one of the few people who can commiserate with how challenging these projects can be. But um, we wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, the other things we'll hit on are some of the design objectives. Uh, so you're clear on what we're trying to achieve through this design and then the design challenges and opportunities that uh, come along with a project like this and the site. I'll go over existing conditions briefly. You can see in context here how the southern expansion ties to both the Memorial Avenue, Eisenhower, which is that main thoroughfare, and then obviously you have Millennium on the upper left-hand corner. Uh, on the left side, you can see the dashed-in site area, but you can see on the right-hand side, we, we place the program on the site so you can understand why we call it transformative. You can really see how this, is, this edge condition is going to change and tie together this monumental corridor of commemorative sites with the 9-11 Memorial, the potential future 9-11 Visitor Education Center, the Air Force Memorial, and Arlington National Cemetery. As we look a little closer at the site, uh, just to go over the existing conditions one more time so you can understand the context we're in, you have Joint Base Meyer-Henderson Hall to the west. We also have Foxcroft Heights that poses some challenges. Arlington National Cemetery doesn't have any residential sites adjacent to it now, so how we handle that, uh, it's a sensitive uh, topic. We have Columbia Pike, the Air Force Memorial, the VDOT facility, uh, 395 VA-27, uh, VA-27 to the far uh, east of the project, you note the Pentagon Memorial, uh, as well as the existing service complex. And as we look out, we're going to transform the overall program. These are the major components that are going into the cemetery expansion, starting with our predecessor project. The predecessor project is the Defense Access Road Project. That is a separate project being led by the Federal Highway Administration. Uh, it's funded by the DOD for impacts on DOD activities on the community. Uh, and it's more than just a roadway realignment. It's also realigning utilities, which are important. You can inter on top of utilities. Uh, so that's our predecessor project, which makes what Carlton mentioned, Southgate Road, uh, partial demolition and partial demolition of South Joyce and Columbia Pike possible by a new road, which is South Nash, running on the west edge of our proposed cemetery site. And then you can see we took, if you will, the hump out of Columbia Pike, which shortened Joyce Street and really took that clover leaf on the far east side of VA 27 and turned it into a tight diamond. So that's our existing condition. So we're sort of designing. <coughs> it's challenging for the team because you're designing to a future condition that isn't there yet and is changing with negotiations with the different stakeholders. But what that uh, leaves us with is the potential future site for the 9-11 Visitor Education Center, uh, which is on the, the, the um, east side of South Joy Street. You have the south parcel. On that south parcel, you have an access control point, a parking garage that will provide parking for visitors to Arlington National Cemetery, visitors to the Air Force Memorial, and employees for the new ops complex. You'll note that to, we, have to stay, you'll, we maximized interrable space by relocating the existing service complex south of Columbia Pike. And to do that, we, had to, uh, we have to design a tunnel underneath Columbia Pike to connect to the cemetery. This is where we are at at 15% design. Uh, this is an important moment because some of the major things that impact circulation occurred between 15% and 35%. Uh, notably, the Air Force Memorial. You'll notice the way the Air Force Memorial is designed today, it is a peninsula off of Columbia Pike. Uh, you can see it's designed really to provide vehicular access off of Columbia Pike. And the design at 15% didn't embrace it. It really, for all intents and purposes, put a wall around that site. The other major change for us, you'll see for access to south of Columbia Pike, we had it off of, or access to the south parcel, excuse me, we had it off of Columbia Pike. The cemetery put the requirement on it that every vehicle should have the ability to be screened. So if you're familiar with the requirements for access control points, that's a pretty darn tight site to try to make one work. That drove the access to South Joy Street. So the 35% site plan looks like this.
To recap on the major evolution of the project, you can see here we've tried to integrate the Air Force Memorial into the southern expansion design. You see we've moved that access point to South Joy Street. Uh, and overall, I think it's a good time now to touch on our design objectives. So with the contiguous land for the cemetery expansion, our primary objective is to have a seamless expansion. Uh, we don't want to walk away from this project and have people know it as the Southern Expansion Project. It will be Arlington National Cemetery when we are complete. For the Air Force Memorial, we've touched on it. You'll notice we're restricting vehicular access now. There will be no more pub public access for vehicles to the Air Force Memorial. They will be driven to the garage or will visit it from um, within the cemetery. Uh, to put that in a little bit of context, Air Force Memorial currently has 350,000 visitors a year and cemetery has 3.5 million visitors. As you imagine, when people visit this, there's going to be a whole different experience, uh, a whole different experience for visitors coming from the cemetery side. We can't just put a wall around this. This is a, an extremely sensitive part of the design that we're looking forward to the commission's opinions on it. We're working with the Commission of Fine Arts. We're working the, with the Air Force District Washington, as well as the Army. The other design objective is Columbia Pike. This realignment, we're working closely with the Federal Highways because we want this to be a model, multimodal corridor, more of a parkway. Uh, it should not only provide, uh, uh, I think we're at a 10-foot bi-directional bicycle path, an 8-foot sidewalk on the north side, as well as an 8-foot sidewalk on the south side, uh, but the additional landscaping serves to make that more of a parkway and continues the language and vocabulary of Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, we can't make 395 go away. We can't change the flight path of the helicopters to the Pentagon, but we can do what we can. Uh, and we think that ha as we do that and we look at Columbia Pike, we look at that really consistent with what we want to do in that south parcel. So the objective of the south parcel is really to disappear and to continue that vegetative buffer of the Columbia Pike off of the cemetery. So from the cemetery, it continues to provide that acoustic and visual buffer. And from 395, and you'll see in a fly through here momentarily, it really becomes a, a landscape base, a datum, if you will, for the Air Force Memorial. Uh, people who arrive in DC, if you come from George Washington or um, Reagan Airport, as soon as you get on 395, this is one of the most visually prominent memorials in the nation. Uh, it is, uh, we've all grown to love it. It's a beautiful memorial and we don't want to detract from it. We want people to look right over the ops complex in South Parcel at this memorial. So to do all this, there are a lot of challenges. Uh, we have a lot of uh, stakeholders. Um, we have a lot of uh, access challenges. There's uh, challenging topography. Uh, this site here, you can see we have over 100 feet of drop from west to east. Uh, and really that provided a lot of opportunities. Uh, if you've been to Arlington National Cemetery, the rolling topography is really one of the most beautiful aspects and we've worked very hard in design to ensure that we maintain that. It also provided us an opportunity to press that ops complex so we could get access under that tunnel without a major impact to the cemetery and provide that visual buffer we discussed earlier. Excuse me, can you just say where the tunnel's coming through? It's hard to tell. Yes. Well, if this has a point, do you mind me? No. Oh. Maybe you can, here, he can do it. Yeah. Where is it? So it's ah. the tunnel itself is coming through right about here. Oh, can't get it. And it comes through, and then it goes this way. Yes. So at about, about here. Yes, sir. Thank you. Wasn't where I was <coughs> seeing it. Thank you. And that really, sir, has a lot to do with where those elevations are. That's the, that is the high point. Uh, we also wanted to make sure we didn't preclude the opportunity for streetcar in the future. So there are a lot of, uh, it's one of those projects where you tug on the string here and, you know, there goes your sleeve here. And, and it was a real balancing act. I'll also point out the tunnel and the fly-through. Um, I don't know if the fly-through, I think you may have to do it from that I'm not side. sure if, I, I wasn't sure if anything was actually starting with this. Let's see. There you go. So this is uh, this sort of gives you some of the ideas what we're challenged with from a, a topography, uh, view shed, access standpoint. Uh, this is the site, and then hopefully 
This is my big whiz bang thing. So if this doesn't work, I don't have much left. There we go. But I didn't realize this actually worked. Uh, this is, I didn't... It's a video. So this is, it helps to give you sort of that perspective, right? You come down. Uh, this is that view from VA 27 when you come past the Pentagon on the uh, left and, the, and that wall on the right. It's this great view of the cemetery and the Air Force Memorial. You see that's the Sheraton Hotel in the background. Uh, we are very deliberate on landscaping to mimic the vocabulary of the existing cemetery. Um, so as you come around, we use that Air Force Memorial really as a visual anchor, and we don't do that just here. We think of that as really an anchor to our southern expansion. You get a look at the columbaria. The goal of those columbaria is really to be less inward looking and more a part of the cemetery, and that's why we bring that landscaping in. You get a glimpse of that tunnel there, sir, yeah. and it curves around, and it doesn't show up so well. Uh, here, but it's right to the left of those garage doors. And you yeah. can see how we really depress down that. So from here, that really functions great for the cemetery. But from the outside perspective, it just com completely disappears from view. So as you come down here, you'll get a little bit of a glimpse of what you're going to see from 395 VA 27, which if you drive this enough, it can be a stopping point. And this is mind. parking here for all visitors or what? Yes. Yeah. So it we have to be super clear. We never intend to replace Memorial Avenue, and that is the primary access. Okay. However, what we did want to do is provide parking for the Air Force Memorial and maybe visitors to loved ones uh, in that side, on that side of the cemetery. And then also we have a requirement to provide parking for the employees that will be working at the ops complex. So that, that entrance can be used by visitors to the, to the cemetery if yes, they sir. have the right credentials. So I have three vignettes that kind of speak a little bit to access and, and that question exactly. Uh, I believe the first one is going to be at South Joy Street looking up to the Air Force Memorial and you'll get a little bit of that landscape frame we described. Uh, the second image is going to be just where you spoke of, sir. It's going to be right at that access point. We're going to introduce a new pedestrian access screening building. Uh, and we talk about that. It's uh, there's a new requirement. If you've been to ANC recently, now you have to be screened. This facility is more akin to the screening at the Ord Wetzel Gate, which is a tent, than it is to the Welcome Center. Uh, so think of it more as a glorified, you know, it's, it's a really understated building to provide security, not just for the cemetery, but it's an opportunity to combine that for the Air Force as well. So we're working with them so you don't have the double requirement to have security. And then when you get into the cemetery at that point, you have the option. You can be at the Air Force Memorial, you can get on the trolley, you go to the Columbaria. Uh, so really what we want to do is uh, uh, provide that flexibility. And I think there's a couple more slides after that, but um, the other one you'll see, it's within the cemetery, and you'll really see how powerful the Air Force Memorial. It already is, but you don't know how to get to it, and we're excited about tying that in to our project. Will the tunnel connect to Pershing Drive, or what drive does it connect to? So it'll come down Eisenhower, and then all those roads you see there. Right, I got you. Okay. The, the, right now they're alpha, beta. You know, <laughs> the, the, you know that's that's a whole whole not, that's out of I my. I think pay the, grade. The, is this the tip of Eisenhower. Eisenhower. Yes, sir. And can you move forward from here? I'm trying. There we go. <laughs> So here we are. We're at South Joyce with the realigned Columbia Pike pushed down. You get a glimpse there on the right, a Sheridan gate. That's a historic gate. We wanted to tip our hat to the past. It's a gate that is currently in storage that we're going to reconstruct at the intersection of South Joyce to give it sort of this monumental arrival point to let people know that, you know, this is Arlington National Cemetery. It will be a folly. It, it is not going to be a functional gate because once you have a functional gate, you're going to have a tremendous footprint of requirements for security. So it's really going to be, they could use it on special occasions, but it's, it's more of a folly than it is an actual functional gate. You get a glimpse of the Air Force Memorial. We're going to go up there in a moment, and you'll get a look at the proposed access building. But here you get a look at that landscape frame and the access point off of South Joy Street. I mean, this makes Columbia, so this is Columbia, I'm looking left to right here? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you're looking yeah. west, sir. This looks, makes Columbia Pike look very tame, very <laughs> 25 miles an hour, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to see it. Um, and I think one of the advantages we have is right there is the intersection at 390, at the Freedman's Bridge there. You do taper off a lot of the traffic, but... I want to test to how fast I drive on Columbia Pike. 
Um, so here you are with your back to the parking garage, essentially. We want to start the visitor experience south of Columbia Pike. Uh, and you can see that if you're familiar with the Air Force Memorial, that's the existing Air Force Memorial sign on the right. On the left is the dedication sign. We're proposing moving that. We're working with Air Force now and CFA and, and we'd love your feedback on what exactly is the right level of movement and you can see the road uh, the uh, pedestrian access point over the roadway crosswalk there we hope that crosswalk is to be signalized not just with flashing yellows but to your point with columbia pike traffic it would be nice to have it be a full signalized intersection um, and you can see the cobble gate we want to underplay that gate because that will be more for dignify or uh, dignitaries than for the general public and this is that view we spoke of. It's really, uh, there's a couple great locations in Arlington now where you get this view and we're really excited about tying it in. I mean, the challenges we have moving forward are going to be integrating the Air Force Memorial uh, and just general integration of the project into the existing cemetery. Uh, the other major one we spoke of a little bit is going to be access, not just pedestrian security access, but vehicular access. Uh, and the other one is going to be the topography, which we really see as a huge opportunity. Uh, and we're really proud of the design team for the way they've integrated that topography into some really creative solutions for the, the cemetery. Mm. With that, uh, this is a, an enlarged plan, but I think for the anticipated design schedule moving forward, uh, the slide sort of speaks for itself, and we'd love to answer any questions from the commission. Well, thank you, Mr. Schwederman. I mean, this is really literally moving heaven and earth. Uh, for this project. Mr. Dixon? No, I, I would also, it's very interesting uh, and exciting. Uh, I happen to have been, I think, the only person here, maybe some staff, that was around when we decided where the Air Force Memorial would be finally. And there was a huge battle, like you know, you know how bad, big it was. We wanted to be over by Iwo Jima. And this tremendous amount of money was spent in planning that. It was a great site too, but then they gave this to us gave it to us, I mean, I guess, gave it to the Air Force. And uh, it's amazing how it's now becoming uh, uh, a very important centerpiece in the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Comments or questions? This is a lot to absorb. This is uh, really important. Thank you for helping to us to begin to understand the extent of the work that you're doing. And this will help us, I think, absorb your proposal as we, we see it in the ensuing months. So we look forward to that, and we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. I think uh, if there are any further comments or questions, I think this concludes uh, today's open session agenda. And if there's no other business, we're adjourned. Thank you.